For the first time in human history, we can imagine a world in which people would choose the work they do in ways and amounts that satisfy them. Western societies have typically refused to look at this possibility, preferring to run on the current treadmill, which has been increasing hours on the job in recent years, in order to increase or at least maintain current standards. The pattern since World War II have broken with the past. There was a steady decline in hours on the job during the first half of the 20th century. In the 50 years since the end of World War II, the decline in hours has slowed, stopped, and even been reversed. This has occurred despite the growing evidence that there are more and more activities where people and the systems of which they are a part would benefit from shorter times at work. What is happening? Why have we refused as a society to take advantage of technological improvements to increase our free time? The essential reason is that for most people, it is taking more hours on the job or more family members at work to maintain existing standards of living. Buying the same amount of goods and services requires more commitment to earning money than was the case in the past. Our current commitment to maximum economic growth has become counterproductive. The real needs of people and communities are no longer to attain more stuff. Rather, more and more people want to enhance their quality of life rather than the quantity of goods they can obtain. People are ready to change the way they evaluate success in their own lives. They are looking for new ways to obtain satisfaction. While I know that people will not settle for failure or for having less of what they value than in the past, I know that they are willing to look at alternatives which are more achievable. I am convinced that one of the reasons change agents have often been ineffective is that they have aimed to convince the public they must give up current standards rather than help them look for more satisfactory directions. Today we shall look at the new ideas which are emerging about work and which offer positive options. More and more employers are sensing that work must engage not only the energies but also the passions of their workers if they are to meet their goals. Even in this new context, however, the idea that we could organize society so that people could choose the work they enjoy seems unrealistic to many. One basic objection always seems to be that nobody would be willing to do the unpleasant work. There are three primary answers to this issue. One is that we fail to recognize how different ideas about desirable work are. Not everybody wants to be involved in thinking. Some prefer hard physical toil. Indeed, when tasks are allocated according to express preferences, it is amazing how much work gets done without people being forced to do what they don't enjoy. It is also critical to recognize that one of the ways that we decrease the amount of toil, as opposed to desirable work, is that we free important people from doing unpleasant work. We are recognizing that separating individuals from the chores and frustrations in inherent in everyday life gives them a distorted perspective which separates them from ordinary concerns and widens the gulf between the elites of the culture and the general public. A third step is to decide which work people do not want to do and concentrate our technological imagination on how to get it done in different ways. But even if it proved impossible to get all the dirty work done these ways, there are two very simple additional steps which are feasible. The first would simply increase the payments for the work that people did not want to do. We would move from our present culture, where the more attractive work is normally the best paid, to one where the least attractive work gain more money. This reversal would have many interesting effects. This way of looking at the world also suggests that in the future there may be competition for the most exciting work that will drive down its financial rewards. The other step that might make sense, although it goes severely against the grain of current thinking, would be to require everybody to engage in, quotes, unpleasant work at some point in their lives. The challenge might come in the teenage years when people have lots of energy. Indeed, what seems unpleasant in later life might be seen as attractive if the structures were created well. 
It has long been recognized that sitting people at school desks when their hormones are running strongly is asking for trouble. In addition, such a process would enable young people of different classes to learn to live and work with each other. In order to discuss these and other questions, Charles Brass, who runs the Future of Work Foundation in Australia, will be talking with me. Charles has been thinking and acting to bring about change for several years. Last year, he found ways to bring me to Australia, and he is now part of a broader effort which will enable me to come back in September and October of this year. Charles, I know from what you have told me in the past that people tend to reject the type of conclusions that I have developed there. You, you have, however, some data on trends which confirms the fact that past trends have already been broken and that we have no choice but to move in radically different directions. Perhaps you can start with some of the things that you talk about when you raise these issues. Robert, uh, thank you for a very thoughtful introduction. You even give me plenty to think about. Uh, one of the slides that I tend to use is a picture of the front cover of the Bureau of Statistics monthly report on employment statistics in 1962. It has two graphics on it, one showing a man working at a lathe, another showing a man sitting at a desk with a telephone, and at the end of the desk is a typewriter and a pretty young girl typing away. And back in 1962, that pretty well described the world of work. The changes since then are huge and profound, not just the technological ones you've raised, but the extent to which work has ceased being a physical activity and become much more the shifting of information, and also, very profoundly, the extent to which women have moved from being a marginal part of the workforce to being nearly 50% of the workforce this year. You also talk about the fact that we think about full-time work. We think about nine to five, Monday to Friday, and that that's really not the norm anymore. Oh, no. Uh, well, certainly nine to five, Monday to Friday, is a working pattern enjoyed or worked by less than 10% of the Australian population in the 1990s. But I think the more interesting phrase is, is the one you used, full-time. Full-time work seems to me to be one of the most offensive phrases ever foisted on a population. <laughs> it began as an industrial concept, particularly in this country, I think as different from other countries where the, uh, the, a very centralised system determined standard working hours. And it's always been a subset of actual hours in a week. I mean, full-time work was originally the sort of 40-hour week and there have always been 168 hours in a week, so it's always been a bit anachronistic in that sense. But what seems to me to have characterised our behaviour in the last 20 years is we seem hell-bent on actually proving that the phrase full-time work means what it says, in that those people who are fortunate enough, in inverted commas, to have a full-time job are now being increasingly required by their employers to demonstrate that they mean it that they are in fact owned by the employer for as much time as the employer can possibly squeeze out of them. And that seems to me to be uh, an inappropriate way to behave. But don't you think that in a sense people are also willing to go along in the sense that they say somehow we have to keep up our standard of living and if the cost is to work harder, isn't it both sides of the equation that uh, there are people, although you know, as we go along, we also remember that there are people playing... I mean, this is an incredibly complex set of fluxes and trends and everything else. But it seems to me some people are still in, well, if we keep working hard enough, we won't have to change the way we live. We won't have to think about the quality of life rather than the standard of living. We won't have to change the perspective we have on life. Yes, well, one of the characteristics of the full-time job is that it also provides a full-time income, although particularly at the bottom end of the spectrum, real wages seem to have been decreasing for a while. But certainly for a hard core of full-time people, uh, the, the rewards have been significant and they have provided people with the opportunity to maintain their standard of living. And the alternate form of work 
uh, which is usually called part-time, but I think actually is much broader than that, and I prefer to use the word contingent forms of work, are uh, not only less secure, but also less remunerative, which makes it difficult for people to maintain those standards. Why are we finding it so difficult to understand that the world of work is so radically different from what it used to be. Why, why do we cling on to images that really don't fit at all? What is it that makes it so difficult for us to just say, this is a new world effort, needs new practices? Because another one of the ones you raise is that talking about retirement in the context that we do, uh, which, you know, when we started uh, in Germany, it was 2% of the people who live over 65. Now the longer life expectancies make the way we think about retirement, at least to me, totally nonsensical. How, how are we so blocked? How do we continue to stick with models that even sort of a cursory examination should lead us to say, hey, we have to rethink this. We've got a debate on Social Security going on in the United States, which assumes that growth is possible forever into the future and that you aren't going to rethink how we uh, conceptualize retirement at all. Yeah, I think talking about retirement is, a, is something we need to do in this conversation. But your original question, why is it that we find it so difficult to conceive the change? I think there is a simple but quite profound answer to that. And that is actually, for me, embodied in the word work itself. When I use the word work, I mean something much more than employment. And yet when... Certainly the political world uses the word work. They are thinking about that range of human activity which fits into the economic way of doing things, which fits into the model that a business, an organisation, uh, has an idea, uh, produces a product or whatever, and then people attach to the wealth that is created in that product through the process of employment, take some money out and then take it home and spend the money. That, that particular form of getting work done that we call employment has always been a very, well, a relatively small subset of the work done in a society. And in fact, over the last 30 years, it seems to me that that as a, as a proportion has been decreasing, and there are some statistics to back that up. And I think if we can just shift our focus away from getting work done through employment to, as you said in your introduction, getting work done through human endeavour and human satisfaction, we would come up with models that were thinking about the future rather than just reproducing the past. Well, I remember when we were talking in Australia, one of your <laughs> vigorous complaints was that whenever you tried to do this sort of conversation and you introduced the word work, you saw people absolutely drifting back to employment. And, of course, we do exactly the same things with the gross national product figures because we say that the only work that counts is remunerated work. And therefore, the gap between a developing country where all the same sorts of home-based work, etc., go on, and Australia is much wider than it really is because all of that work takes place all over the world and yet we have made it invisible to ourselves. And in consequence, we sort of say, well, if we give them more implied work, everything is getting better. And forgetting what are the crosscuts about what that does to the other work that goes on in the culture, and, of course, the social structures that get damaged in that process of saying, oh, you've all got to be in a job in order to have a meaningful life, in order to have resources, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Yes, it's a, it's a very big challenge, uh, and it, for me, it, uh, another one of the, the phrases that I use is that I describe unemployment as a myth, uh, which gets a bit of a laugh occasionally, because probably a sardonic laugh, because many people are clearly affected by increasing levels of unemployment. How can we possibly describe unemployment as a myth? Well, it's for exactly this reason. The particular form of work that we do in employment seems to be in some short supply. But the amount of work we want done as a people in Australia seems to be, if not increasing, certainly far beyond the current amount of work that's done. If I sit down with people and invite them to make a list of things they would like done 
that are not done. Everybody can come up with a list. And most people can come up with a list of people they know who are not doing as much as they want to do. So to suggest we have a shortage of work seems to me to be crazy. So it does seem to me that the question is not about work that needs doing or whether there is some, whether perhaps technology is, is replacing people with machines. It does seem to me the question is about value and how is it that a society creates value? How is it that people attach to that value or how is it distributed? And that's where I think we need to focus the question. Why is it that we have, in a sense, lost touch with the other values? I mean, the United States is a classic case of this, where all sorts of human work relationships, for example, childcare, is incredibly yes. badly compensated. Um, almost all of the work which actually helps people to make more sense of their lives is the work that doesn't get paid. And now what's getting paid is this incredible uh, monster of information which, at least in my mind, is eating us up in info glut. And I, suppose, I hope at some point we're going to say, you know, you can have too much information. Uh, so what I how, I mean, how do you engage this question? What are, the, what are the places when you talk to people and audiences where they sort of say, aha, I'd never thought of it that way, and if I think about it that way, I begin to see what you're getting at. Well, Robert, that brings me right back to my first contact with you, and that is your, I mean, your most recent book is called Reworking Success, and the point you make in there is that the success criteria of the 20th century cannot afford to be the success, the success criteria of the 21st. And I think this is where we do have this big dilemma. If you just stand back and have a look, even in even with the increased division in our societies, both in your country and in mine, there is no doubt that this economic world has reaped huge benefits, not just in physical things, and not just in the technology that allows us to sit on opposite sides of the world and talk today. With a little difficulty in the, in the connections. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. But the audience doesn't need to know about that. Well, why not? <laughs> but also in, <laughs> also in our increased lifespans, and uh, our increased health and our capacity to deal with with uh, the things that would have would have killed us years ago we've been hugely successful and i think because of that success we have continued to do well what has brought us that success and it is only now slowly that we're coming to the point of saying well yes it's true that that brought some success but we left some things behind so can we just hold on for a while and bring those other things up to the same level so we can go forward as whole human beings rather than just part human beings? And to come back to your original question, it's about that point where my audiences start immediately to say, yes, that's how I feel. I feel as though a significant part of me is being left behind, but I'm so caught up in a system that seems out of my control that I can't do anything about it. Yes, and I mean, I think one of the surprises we've had in the work we've been doing together is how much resonance there really is if we could only put it together, but it's still sort of fragmented. And the number of people who have written and called and said, you're speaking to the concern I have, but how do we deal with this in a culture which clearly sees at least at the sort of public level, these sorts of questions as irrelevant, crazy, marginal, or any of those terms. How, how do we get together so we can begin to say, look, we're not marginal, there are lots of us out here, in fact, probably we're a majority, and it is the rhetoric of the elite that is the marginal thing. If only we could get together and talk about what matters to us. Yes, there's a a nice phrase in in a newspaper article that I read the other day by an economist here in here in Melbourne. He said that as as human beings, we want to uh, shop twenty four hours a day. We want to be entertained twenty four hours a day. We want to have all those benefits. But as employees, we still want to work nine to five, Monday to Friday. And I think there's uh, there's something in that tension that. We've created this world in which we see ourselves as divided into employees and then people. Huh. 
And it's some reconception of that as a whole, that we're, where we start seeing ourselves as having multiple parts, but of being part of a coherent whole. Somewhere in there, we're going to find a way of getting people together. You know, there's, I want to come back to your reworking success, because it seems to me that one of our dilemmas is that cultures really have never changed in history. At least this is how I read Arnold Toynbee. And what has happened is cultures have said, we're doing very well, we're going to go on doing very well, and eventually they ran out their string and some other culture which had started from a different later place said, okay, we can do better than you can and took over. Now, there are a couple of problems with that, it seems to me. First of all, we're part of the cultures which would lose, but secondly, I think much more... Uh, deeply. I think we do live in a global culture. I don't think you can now say that China or India or anywhere else is not caught in the same set of success criteria that the West has imposed. And unless somehow we can find a new process whereby we as individuals, as communities, as internet communities, as all of these things begin to say we must have this conversation, we must ask whether this is the success we want. And that perhaps gives us a different framing. It makes it easier, perhaps, for us to say, well, it's not surprising this is difficult. It, it has to be difficult. This is new. This is not something where we're immensely skilled. And perhaps our frustration with ourselves in terms of, well, we haven't got it right yet, and we keep on having difficulty moving, changing, etc., would be less hard to handle if we realize just what a huge shift this was in the way we've always run societies. Yes, well, you, you strike a very personal note with me. As you know, four years ago, I had a, what I think would be described as a pretty successful corporate career. And the main reason that I quit that career was the fear, because I have young children, that exactly what you've just described would take place, that some other society somewhere... Uh, and it, it might be, well, wherever it comes from, some other society somewhere is going to take over because we're too stupid to change. And I found it difficult to look my children in the eye and say that that was the world I was creating for them. And I have to say that while the last three years or so haven't been easy, they have at least made it clear to me that it is possible and that the only restrictions exist inside our head. The technology now exists to do things in almost any way we like. And that seems to me to be the real wonder of the late 20th, 20th century. We now have the technology to do things almost any way we like. We seem hell-bent on doing them in one particular way, which seems to be the biggest and the fastest. But there's no reason why we have to do them that way. And recapturing some of this, for me, seems to be giving enough of us, enough understanding about the technology to be able to say, hey, why don't we do it this way? And then we will go fast when we need to go fast, but we'll also go slow when we need to go slow. Well, let's imagine somebody listening to this program at the moment. Let's assume they're liking it. And they say, all right, this is great stuff. What do I do? And I mean, you know, the trouble is that you can't answer it as we both know on a generic basis. But how does one go to that person, or how does one speak to that person, besides saying, in a sense, unfortunately we can't answer that question, it's a question you've got to answer for yourself, because you are in a unique position, you have your unique issues, and you have to find what you can do, but is there, is there another cut beyond that where we can say, but there are nevertheless some things that we can talk about with you, about right livelihood or about companies needing to operate differently, like, for example, the similar company in Brazil, which says we can really involve all of our employ employees in this, and that, as you said in one of your notes to me, uh, essentially the business is not more than the common purposes of the employees. Yes, well, you're right, it is difficult to say to any one individual. Uh, and, I, and I think in addition to what you've just said, there's another reason why it's difficult, and that is that we are dividing our society into people who are seen as successful, the way we define success at the moment, and it's very difficult for those people to give up that success. And then on the other hand, we have people who are pretty well excluded from the system. 
and all they see is, well, just let me in there, let me in and give me some access to some of this and the world will be better. So it is difficult to talk to people. But I think we can make some, some general statements about what the future will look like if we're going to go down the road we're talking compared to the present. At the moment, and it seems to me the language of economics helps here, at the moment the world seems consumed with the concept of a transaction or the concept of transactions. Everything is being done on a transactional basis. And my understanding of a transaction is that, first of all, it's done between relatively distant parties, parties who are probably coming together purely for the purposes of this particular transaction, and that the, the nature of the transaction and the value that's created in it is, being, is able, in some sense, to be objectively verified by a third party. So in this country, for example, we have competition commissions, we have ombuds people, we have all sorts of infrastructures in place which are supposed to protect the, the objectivity of the transactions that take place in the economic world. And clearly, many of the things that happen in our world happen to have to happen through that transactional basis. If we're never going to have any future contact with each other, then we've got to have some mechanism in place that tries to restore a common base and, and some equity between the partners so that uh, things are done fairly. But most of what actually drives us as human beings, it seems to me, is much more about relationship than about transaction. And the essential differences in the context that I'm putting them here are that, first of all, the relationship is between parties who intend to have some ongoing contact with each other. So protection from, from an, a, a, an imbalance can be restored or organised in the ongoing sequence of contact between people. But most particularly that the value that is determined in a relationship is mixed up with the whole relationship concept. Concept, it's it's not meant to be objectively seen. It's it's not intended, for example, that there be some objective measure of the amount of pocket money you give your children. <laughs> that really is something that's messed up with the whole business of family dynamics and your particular circumstance and relationship. And it makes little sense at all to talk about an international standard for pocket money. <laughs> have, have we done that yet? <laughs> well, no, I'm sure someone's going to suggest it now that I've raised the idea. <laughs> and so it seems to me that if this is true, if there is a sense in which people want to recapture some sense of that relationship, then what that means for the future is that another word that you use enormously, the, the word community, is going to have to characterise much more of the way in which we behave than it does at the moment. And that instead of seem making ourselves hell-bent on coming up with internationally competitive standards for everything. What we're much... What we need those standards. Clearly the environment, for example, must be dealt with on a global basis. We can't have separate standards. But at the opposite extreme, there are a whole raft of things which, if we're going to regain them, the value that we're creating, the work that we're doing, it's going to be done in concert with people with whom we have an enduring relationship in a community of some sort. Well, you raised at least three ones for me on this one. <laughs> uh, the first one's nice and short. Uh, I was talking to a group of pastors and I was bemoaning exactly the same pattern that everything was becoming transactional and you didn't pass things back over and forth over the, the, the fence anymore and, you know, everything in the yes. community was becoming, uh, well, I buy from you, I don't, we don't have potlucks, we don't do things just because they're nice to do and money doesn't get yes. into it. We don't have as much community fairs where everybody mucks in and you can't possibly calculate. And I said, you know, sooner or later we're going to have catered church suppers. And they said, that's yes. a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> And I it said, takes oh, all the pressure off the pastor's wife. Yeah, I don't think that was the point I was trying to make. The second point, though, is the, the point about the Japanese culture. Because Westerners may find doing business in Japan very difficult because it is a relationship business. It is not yeah. primarily a transactional business. And there's a covenant more than a contract. And they say, well, 
there's no way we can cover everything in, in this contract. There's no way we can get everything transactional. But we want to continue to work with each other. And as things change, we will try to remain in a system that feels fair to all of us. And that's how to work. Yes. But, but it, it makes sense, it seems to me, of exactly what you're saying. And, of course, Westerners, at least, for, I haven't tried to do business in Japan, but from everything I hear, Westerners go crazy because they can't understand the framework in which that discussion is taking place. But let me just come to the third one because it's the one that I have just become particularly fascinated about because of some new learnings. And that is that I am finding that people in communities, in sub-neighborhoods, are just beginning to say, you will either give us more ability to make decisions about our lives, or we are going to make life very difficult for you. That we're no mm -hmm. longer willing to have city government say, we make a decision for all of Melbourne, or all of LA, or all of even Spokane, which is a much smaller city, which is where I'm now living. And a friend of mine rang me up in great excitement from um, LA, because he'd been reading my book, and he then fell across a very long article in the LA Times just the other day, uh, which said neighborhoods are threatening to secede from Los Angeles because they're saying we are not being given any freedom to make sense of our neighborhoods. And when yeah. I worked in Spokane and had a long conversation in Spokane, uh, we were amazed to find out how much is already happening to bring things down from the city level to the neighborhood, to the family, and to challenge what I think is core to this, which is that we've run on experts and professionals who have said, we will do the work and we will tell you how to live your lives. And it seems to me that what we're talking about is that people are going to have to learn to live their own lives. And that that's a whole different set, and in a sense the whole piece we've done on education and health in these programs and community all ties into that extraordinary issue that if it's not going to be run from the top down, not going to be run by experts and professionals, people are going to have to know what their choices are and you don't do that transactionally. No, and, and since I know the other programs have focused on other things, but if we concentrate on the work aspect of this, your comment about experts, uh, once upon a time, and it's not that long ago, most of the knowledge in the world did reside with experts. That has changed. Uh, as we now see in, in the newspapers regularly, you can now build and buy almost anything across the internet, uh, whether it be good, bad or indifferent. So if you are a neighbourhood or a local community or even a group of people who, are, who don't necessarily live, with, live near one another but who have some other bond, you're no longer as reliant on those experts. Provided you can gain control over some significant parts of your life because what most of us in cities have done is give away our capacity to provide almost anything for ourselves. We've become almost totally dependent on someone else to provide everything, to provide our food, to provide our electricity, to provide just about everything we use. And somewhere we're going to need to use that knowledge to recapture a sense of ourselves but also some of the critical things, some of the work that we need to do to be done in a way that we can provide for ourselves rather than relying on other people to provide for us. Are things like, well, first of all, uh, as you know, of course, technology is making all of that more feasible. The, the potential of bringing things home yes. again is very real. Do you see local currencies, the, in a sense, the, a currency for a neighbourhood, for example, as a way to do this, as a way to say, look, we have things which we can create for each other and which, because we're using a local currency, will be, in a sense, cheaper because we don't have to buy national currency to do this. The other side of that, of course, is transactions, and we need to remember this. For busy people, transactions are wonderful, you know. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, and that's our problem, you know. It's easier to do transactions than relationships uh, at one level. Absolutely. It's, it's also destructive, and we have to recognize that there are benefits to the relational model and the relational work model, which go beyond the efficiency of the transactional model. Uh, yeah, like you said, you, we're raising a lot of things in this conversation. <laughs> it's, it's a very wide <laughs> Well, that's the purpose of these ones. I hope they're going to like them. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, that's good. The, with respect to currencies, I think the issue here 
is, is this question of the creation of value. One of the things that we've given away uh, through this employment model is any sense in which we as human beings can create value. Uh, the only way we know how to create value, at least in theory, is that we start a business uh, and then you enter into economic transactions. And one of the reasons for that is that the, the representation of value that we use in our society is a national or an international currency. And one of the characteristics of that currency is that only a select group of people are able to make this stuff. You can't just create it yourself. That's called forgery. You go to jail. And so we, we've taken away from ourselves any belief that we can actually create value. And one of the things that local currencies do, and I'm involved in some, and, and there are many examples in Australia and around the world, is they, they allow people to, in relationships with one another, to say, hey, we think we've created some value here and that we can represent that value in some way. And then it is exchanged and traded among themselves. And it's that capacity to create something that you can then eat. You don't necessarily have to create your own food. I mean, my, we talked earlier about at what point in the conversation do people feel good. Well, it's at about this point in the conversation when people stop and they say, ah, oh, you want us all to live on kibbutzes or you're a closet socialist. Well, n neither of those things are necessarily true. You don't necessarily have to go back to the point where everybody's creating their own food, but you need to be able to create something that allows you to eat. You can't do that with Australian dollars. They're created somewhere else, and there's another whole hour-long program about how that stuff is created and distributed. But because the economic world is ignoring so much of the real work that is done and work that we believe is valuable, I think there is a huge opportunity here for people and communities and neighbourhoods to reclaim some of that, if you like, under the very nose of the economic system through local currencies. And, you know... You mentioned it doesn't have to be food, but there is a profound sense, I think, in which shifting the food patterns is a part of this puzzle. That the neighborhood garden, I have a friend who produced a garden, worked to create a garden in New Orleans, and what that did to that neighborhood was extraordinary. I mean, first it produced food, oh, yes. but it produced a different sense of relationship to people. And it's, it's not a very good neighbourhood. It's the sort of place where you would expect somebody to come in and rip off the garden, climb over the fence. I mean, the fence isn't unclimbable. And, you know, one morning you're going to wake up and find out all the stuff's gone. Yeah, nothing there. But it doesn't happen because something occurs in that neighbourhood and the neighbourhood decides that they're going to protect it. It's the same thing with Blockwatch, which is one of the most extraordinary phenomena to me because... The police, you know, it's interesting who supports different models. The police might have said, well, we don't want our part of control the neighbourhoods taken away. And what they said instead was, we can't police this place. And the only yes. way this is going to happen is if you as a neighbourhood become part of the, of the process by which you control your own neighbourhood. And it is... It, it's an incredibly subtle shift, but I, it, it, it seems to me to have gone a long way. And I like the way you're talking about if we can begin to say that relationships do create value and not everything's transactional and a lot of the things that go on in the garden really, I mean, in a sense you can do that more efficiently, you can probably do it probably yes. with less money, but you're making sense of your life. In, in, in that's very it. That's it, it seems to me. I mean, that's the your phrase, the phrase... I use almost every day of my life, which, for which I'm eternally grateful to you, the phrase right livelihood. Making sense of why it is we're here. And certainly for me, it seemed to make little sense much of what I was doing in the past. It only made sense if I believed that the money I was getting was going to get me something. And increasingly I and my colleagues were finding that, yes, we were getting money, but we weren't able to do anything meaningful with it. And the things you're describing around community gardens and all sorts of community programs seem to me to go a long way to reports not only getting work done, but providing that sense of, why am I here? What's my real purpose on this earth? You know, one of the interesting things that uh, one of the books uh, suggests that if you think about money in terms of how long it takes you to make it, 
An awful lot of purchases suddenly seem pretty nonsensical. In other words, instead of saying it's going to cost me this amount of dollars, you say it's going to take this amount of my life. And you say, eh, is it really worth that amount of my life to buy a hat or to buy this new gimmick? Or to... And, of course, there's all the other data which shows that consumption gives you a very short satisfaction hit. You know, you say it doesn't last very long. You buy the thing and, you know, maybe you feel good about it for a couple of days or a week or a month. But for most people, those things don't really make their life better, it seems to me. And that's, of course, what advertising keeps on saying. Well, if you do this, your life will be complete. But I don't think many people really, and I think that's the point you're making, that money doesn't buy happiness. There's all sorts of data beginning to come out about lots of money not doing much for you. Next, you need a certain amount. I mean, that's, you know, when we, you know, people start saying, well, you're saying we're going to do without money. Of course we're not saying you're going to do without money. We're saying that beyond a certain amount of money, you have to ask what it's bringing you and what you're paying yes. for it. Yes. I'll give you a, a small personal example. My Saturday afternoons used to involve starting up a lawnmower mowing the lawn and then when I'd finished because I was all hot and sweaty and because I was worried about becoming overweight I'd go for a run and take <laughs> the dogs for a run. Then the lawnmower broke down and we wandered into the lawnmower buying shop and looked at various lawnmowers and saw a modern technologically developed push-pull lawnmower. And I went to a colleague I know who's a, a personal trainer and I said, listen, do you reckon if I used a push-pull lawnmower on my lawn and you gave me a couple of things to think about while I was doing it, I could get the same exercise as I would while I was running? He said, not only that, you do less damage to your body. So I now have a push-pull lawnmower and as I'm mowing the lawn, I'm doing my exercise. I don't need the $150 Nike runners to go running. I wear a grotty old pair that get uh, green and dirty. I'm out in my yard mowing the lawn. Technology is a significant part of this. The lawnmower that I use today would not have been able to have been bought in the 1950s and push-pull lawnmowers weren't capable of mowing the lawn. They now are. And instead of the typical economic world saying you buy the biggest and the best lawnmower and maybe if I was being creative I'd share it with my neighbour, I'm actually, I believe, using technology to actually make my life more meaningful rather than just going through a series of tasks during the day. Well, I was actually going to push it out the way you were going. I didn't push it out, which is to say, and if it's that simple, maybe you can share it with your neighbor with much less risk that it's going to come back in a totally non-usable uh, state. Because, I mean, <laughs> if you've too. got a very high-tech thing, you're not about to lend that because if it gets broken, you know, then where are you? And that, that's then, a good thought. And then that opens up the whole question of how many lawnmowers do you need on a block and, you know, one of the interesting things that's happening in certain cities is how many cars do you need in a block? And people are beginning to find out that you can own cars jointly instead of everybody having a car which sits in the garage most of the time. Now, it's not simple. But again, if you start thinking about what technology allows us to do and how far ahead we can book and how much, we c how much better we can get it using the time we have and the equipment so it's used well, we, you know, let me give you one other crazy idea, which is we live with the concept of the weekend. We were talking about the whole nine to five idea, okay? But we still sort of keep the concept of the weekend. So we have the weekend yeah. when everything is busy, you know, all the uh, recreation stuff, and you have the week when all the offices are full. Well, supposing we said that's an outdated idea and we want to use our facilities much more evenly. Now, you know, everybody says you can't do that. And I say, well, why not? Why can't you rethink this and say we have 365 days in the year and it's really stupid that some days everything is crowded and some days, every, you know, things aren't being used very much. And instead yeah. of, you know, so it's, it's those sorts of conceptual leaps, it seems to me, which then would allow you to think about work. And some people like working at nights. I mean, it's a nightmare for me. But some people actually enjoy working at nights. And I said, I couldn't do that if you paid me. Well, paid me a lot. I'm glad you do. <laughs> but if you want I'll give to... you a, 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 real, a real example, uh, Robert, again, from my own neighbourhood. And uh, I'm sure many of our listeners are suffering from the same 
the problems that uh, that our local primary school is, and that is that the, the governments, which have traditionally been responsible for education, are increasingly saying, we're going to put less and less resources in and make you more and more responsible yourself for what goes on in the school. Now, uh, there are lots of protests, and, and uh, I don't for one minute want to suggest that, that, uh, that I'm, I'm endorsing what the governments are doing. And, and certainly a lot, lots of people are complaining and there probably is room for more resources to go in. But the other side of this is that what the governments have done in our school, for example, is they have given the school community a million-dollar asset and said it's yours. Do with it what you like. And that million-dollar asset is utilised, as you've just pointed out, about 18 or 20% of the time. Now, we're just beginning to explore... Given that they've said to us, it's yours, do with it what you want, what it might mean to utilise that asset. It's a million dollars they've given us. And the school is slowly starting to think about some of the things you've just talked about as a way of capturing our ability to take advantage of what the government thinks is a reduction. But for us, it's a bonus. I love that. And in fact, when we talked in Spokane just the other week, People were saying the schools are the natural organizing process for the neighborhood. That still typically the people there are within a geographical area and yep. they have some commonalities. They may have forgotten those commonalities, but they have them. And if uh, I've done a lot of work with something called the Mott Foundation in this country, which has talked about how community schools could revolutionize the way we, we move if we recognize that you don't use the school for six hours a day only in school terms, etc., etc., And as you yeah. say, it's a huge facility. Now, if you started looking at churches, churches, yes. uh, you know, how, how often are they used? We don't need more facilities. We just stop, need to stop having boundaries which say work takes place in this sort of place, not in that sort of place, etc., etc. Now, I think, you know, we've got about four minutes left. How do we... I think what we need to remind people of is that we have sort of broadened the issue out from work and we've said, yeah, well, if you talk about employment, all of these issues, you know, are sort of trivial. Once you start getting it around and saying, but we're really interested in how the work of the culture takes place, then there are all of these openings. And I think maybe we answered the question I asked earlier, but not quite in the way I expected, which was, what could we say to people who had some wanted to do something. We said, here are some ways we've begun to think about it. Probably you've thought about it, but you haven't thought it was feasible. Why don't you get serious about what your thinking is and your action is? Yeah, and I think before we finish, we ought to come back to something you raised on the, along the same line, and that was the concept of retirement. The concept of retirement is a purely economic concept. And in fact, it's even an outdated economic concept because it arose at a time when people's bodies were so badly abused by the work they were doing that they weren't able to continue it in later life. Even that's changed. Most of the work that people do now, they're perfectly capable, even in an economic sense, perfectly capable of doing it into the latter years of their life. But the real thing here, and it's, it's at the core of everything we've said, is that it's people who have the capacity to make a contribution. It's people who create the value. It's people who... Uh, it, it's the relationships between people that makes up a society and there's absolutely no reason why that has to stop on someone's 65th birthday <laughs> and particularly in a community sense. The, it seems to me crazy. The one, one thing we haven't learned from our Indigenous populations, and you know this is in, in your country as well, is that they have respect for their elders. They actually don't think you've learnt anything until you're 65. We think once you've hit 50, you've got nothing to contribute. It's crazy. Well, you know, if we were willing to talk about bringing in the energy of all of the people over 65, but let me throw one other in because we were talking about the schools. Why do we assume that the best way to raise kids is to cut them off from reality for 15 to 20 years or 12 to 15 or, you know, whatever, and rather than saying here we have young people with extraordinary energy and that you learn best out in the culture? and that there is work they can be doing which is also learning. And if you did that, you've suddenly got a huge population which begins to respond to, hey, look at all the work that needs doing in our culture if this is to be a decent place to live. Absolutely. You know, 
as we close this, as it runs down, what fascinates me about our conversation is I think people would say, well, that's not what we think the conversation about work is. But I, that's nice. That, now, now I got a different cut on maybe what people are saying when they say we need a new work vision. Does that make sense to you? Yes, I, I understand. Uh, you start talking about statistics like how many women there are in the workforce and telecommuting and working hours, and then you end up talking about education and community and lawnmowers. We seem to have come a long way. <laughs> but it does, it does seem to me it is about what, what we want done together and collectively and individually, and, and that's what work is. We've got a particular way of organising that called economic employment, are there some other ways we can organise that give us a bit more meaning? The answer is yes, and the only question is when are we going to do it? And so let me leave with you all with a question. How can each of you engage in changing the work patterns of our culture so that they provide satisfaction to you and also give access to a reasonable level of resources? Thank you for listening. In the first program of this series, I argued that we were being forced to move beyond the cultural trance which has been imposed by the industrial era. We have now explored the subjects of family and community, learning and work. Today we take up the subject of health. This of course ties directly into the theme of this whole series, the healing century. Perhaps the most dramatic example of the strength of our industrial era model is the way that we have learned to treat our bodies. For many people, they are machines which can be fixed by doctors without our participation. We expect the same sort of service which is available in a garage. The malfunctioning part of our body can be mended or replaced, and then life can continue as before. This way of looking at our bodies has always been challenged by some thinkers, notably Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science. The extent and depth of the challenge has increased in the last 20 years. We are learning the intricate connections between body, mind, and spirit. We are discovering that our bodies have the capacity to heal themselves, and that one high priority must be to support this healing ability rather than to undermine it. I was lucky enough to be part of the movement toward health in the early 70s. It seemed like a lost cause at this time. But over the last decades, the body repair model has lost its attractiveness for many reasons. One of them was the recognition that it encouraged people to continue to abuse their constitutions with overeating, smoking, alcohol, and drugs. Doctors would fix them up without challenging them to change the patterns which were leading them to become sick again and again. The second problem with the model was that visible symptoms often masked deeper problems which might not be physical at all. Assembly line medicine often failed to catch these more serious problems which continued to develop the eventual cost to society was therefore far higher. A third set of questions emerged as evidence mounted that the waste products of the industrial era were dramatically increasing rates of cancer, asthma, and other diseases. The interconnections between the outside world and the body were forced on the medical establishment, which found it could not do things to reduce incident rates unless cultural dynamics were shifted. This required working to achieve social as well as individual change. The deepest cause of the shift towards healing and health was, however, a move towards an increasingly spiritual orientation in the culture. People found that they could only make sense of their lives if they filled the hole in their bellies, which they had attempted to satisfy with a very wide range of addictions. As they did so, they saw that their health was largely their own responsibility, rather than something that could be handed to the medical establishment. Today, there is a widespread societal recognition that our physical, mental, and spiritual health are all tightly connected. The growing intellectual respect respectability of this set of ideas was demonstrated when Harvard University held a major conference on the effects of prayer in 1997. We have now moved far beyond the debunking of alternative medicine which persisted into the 90s. Today the question is the right mesh between various approaches for different patients, rather than insistence on a single model. For example, Chinese skills such as acupuncture and herbal remedies are now part of accepted practice and often paid for by insurance. 
This change world has its dangers as well as its huge benefits. We know that people often get sick when they want to and get well when they choose. However, we must be always very careful to recognize that there is a vast difference between often and always. There are some health fanatics who make people who cannot cure themselves feel guilty because of their failures. Some groups and sects go so far as to refuse medical help and is clearly the only useful direction and thus cause needless suffering and even death. To explore the benefits and the possible pitfalls of our emerging understandings about health, I shall engage in dialogue with Tess Taft. We shall examine the world in which each human being's health needs and patterns will be recognized as unique. We shall also look at the parallels between personal, social, and environmental healing. Tess brings to our discussion an enormous depth of experience working with people whose lives have been affected by a dramatic diagnosis which breaks the tenor of their lives. Much of this work has been in the field of cancer. She has made, helped people make the choice between healing unto life or death. She deeply believes that the healing process is possible whether one is committed to life or when one has seen that death is the direction. Tess, following our conversations we have had with each other, it seems suitable to start from the point when people are forced to look at their lives because of some dramatic new diagnosis. Given your commitment to healing, where do you start? I know that this has to depend largely on the person, but are there some guidelines which you can suggest? What's different if one is committed to healing rather than fixing things? That's a good question, Robert. I think that if the commitment <clears throat> is based on healing, we need to start from within. And the change that I've seen in the 25 years I've been working with cancer patients is that people are increasingly uh, turning to their own sense of spirituality to help them heal, in addition to asking and sometimes demanding the medical profession to join them in that place. For example, it was a very rare occurrence 25 years ago or even 15 years ago for me to hear patients asking me or their physician to pray with them. Now it occurs frequently and doctors talk about their lack of ease in that situation and I often talk with doctors about how to do that. It was a, a surprise to me when someone asked me to pray with them. And um, I've come s since that point to uh, feel a great ease with that myself. I think that, that the biggest change that needs to occur for people to see themselves as able to bring their own spirit to the healing is a requirement that people be willing to allow a disaster for example, a cancer diagnosis, the death of a child, an earthquake, whatever the disaster might be, people need to allow the disaster to change fundamentally who they are, how they see the world, their experience with God. You said that you've seen a huge shift in that 25 years. Can you expand on that a bit? What, what's been going on? I know in my life, which has been in a different area, the difference between when I started and now is just extraordinary. And I think part of our problem as a culture is we fail to recognize how far we've come and we're sort of caught back 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 50 years in the past. And we're still sort of trying to deal with where people were, where the culture was then, rather than really accepting that this is a radically different place. Not for everybody. I mean, one of the things I want to get into later is some people are ready for this new approach and some people aren't and pushing it on them doesn't help. But you're talking really about an enormous shift in the people you see, um, many of them, not all of them. Yes, I am. I think a good example of the shift is that over the years I've noticed that there are basically two types of patients, although it's not fair to say that. <laughs> but. All generalizations are wrong, but they're useful. Exactly, right? exactly. There has come over time a large number of people who see themselves in the healing process with their physician as being a member of the team, the healing team. These people want to know the research about their own illness. Uh, they want to know all the alternatives that are open to them. They want a physician to be able to answer 37 questions without questioning them about the number of questions they have. They want to be respected and seen as a peer. 
these people often started calling their doctors by their first names. When this began to happen, there were very few physicians who could tolerate that and enjoy it. And um, on the other hand, there are people who um, go to the medical experience with their arms out saying, stick the needles in me, heal me, doc. And so what the shift I've seen happen is about the number of people that have moved into wanting to be on a, a part of the team and seen by the entire medical team as a member of the team. Well, of course, my own experience when I got diagnosed with esophageal cancer now six months ago sort of fits into that. It wasn't something I expected to happen. My father died of, a, uh, of throat cancer but when he was very young, and I thought that I dodged that bullet partly because I had a totally different body type, uh, and the side of the family that looks like me doesn't get cancer. But when I found out about it, of course, uh, being on the internet, I got bombarded with messages, 377 sure cures, which is a little confusing to say the least of it. And then I found this wonderful surgeon in, in Spokane called Ryan Holbrook, and he has become my friend. Um, I mean, it's even beyond, you know, just calling him by the right name. We are now friends. I'm friend with his wife. And it has been an extraordinary experience working with him because he, for example, wanted me to do chemo and radiation. I said, I don't believe in them. And he said, okay, well, I don't like that much, but you seem to know what you're about and you've got to make your own choices. And the difference being, in my mind, that he didn't say to you, well, then I can't work with you. Yes, exactly. That's the key, or a key. So, as is there a way that we could, in a sense, give people this choice better at the moment? Because at the moment, people end up with the wrong doctors, obviously. I mean, some end up with the doctors who still want to stick needles in them, and other people end up with the doctor who has now become comfortable with saying, well, I've got to give you all the options, and may overload somebody who really can't cope with the options and who is worse off because they say, well, you really need to understand what they, what's going on. They say, I don't need to yes. understand. I don't need. And in a sense, we, those of us who have learned that some people do and some people don't really ought to be able to do both. I understand why the people, in a sense, who haven't learned can't do the other. Could we, could we set up a better system by which we could make that choice early in the diagnosis process? Well, it seems to me that if people are aware of the type of patient they are, the type of person they are, uh, they w might be able to, for example, when they make the appointment, ask to talk to the nurse of this physician. And if that can't happen right at the moment, she could call them at home. And they could ask, say to her, I'm this type of person. I need all the information I can get. I'm reading research. I have questions. I need the, a doctor who will be able to really talk with me about the disease and consider me part of the team. Can you direct me to one of the physicians in this practice who could work best with me? That's what I would do if, if I got a cancer diagnosis. Understanding that for people who don't want all the information, the people who say, Doc, fix me, their anxiety increases tremendously if they're shoved into being a team member. Though team members increase their their anxiety increases dramatically if they're le if they're uh, pushed out of being a team member. But that's tough in a sense because what about the person who doesn't know about that still assumes that the sort of doctor you need is going to be the one they get. In other words, they assume the doctors still do the thing properly. You know that yeah. they, uh, you go in. They say, well, this is the operation you're going to have. You go in this day, and we'll fix you up. Yeah. I mean, could we, I mean, is it conceivable that in a community we would, in a sense, set up a process by which that one of the first things we do would be to help people to make that, rather than, in a sense, what you're saying is the patient ought to be sufficiently well together and far along uh, that they know how to ask that. But if it... If cancer is the first serious disease they've had, which is true of me, uh, you may not really have exactly. that set of skills, and you may you may know that at one level, but you may not have the ability to to verbalize it. Yeah. Well, ideally, there should be someone on the cancer staff itself who is the greeter, for example, and and that's their job is to be the greeter and greet patients, get to know them a little bit. It would serve many purposes. One purpose would be to humanize the the, the medical office. 
uh, which can, can reduce a tremendous amount of fear that people come with right off the bat. And that person then could say, I'm here to get to know you and to fit you with the physician I think that would work best with you. That would be ideal. And I, 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 uh, I expect more of that in years to come because I'm, I think that we're living in a very exciting time in, in the world of healing. I think that more and more people in more and more uh, physicians' offices are changing to accommodate that kind of thing. But then on the other hand, my sense as an outsider in this business is a lot of the medical administration, the establishment, the funding, the financing is moving in the other direction and becoming less and less willing to spend time on frills. Now, the fact that they aren't frills because we know people get cured quicker and you can get out of hospital quicker and if you pray, uh, you get out quicker and I mean it's very much in the monetary interest of the hospital it doesn't seem to affect the people who are making these decisions. And I hear the cutting out on one side of exactly the thing you're talking about. Yes. Is there, I mean, is, first of all is that correct and secondly how could one avoid in a sense this becoming a battle between two radically different ways of, of doing things, which I think isn't going to help us at all, rather than this movement you're talking about towards slowly moving this into the system so that it becomes the norm. I know that there are some uh, people who I met at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, who talk about the system that's being developed for patient care in Minnesota. And apparently it's on the cutting edge. And what these people believe is that the system of managed care that we have now in America is going to cut its own throat very quickly because patients are dissatisfied. And what they believe is that eventually the dissatisfaction of patients are going to push a change that will make um, health care a non-profit business or a non-profit service. And at that time, part of what patients are going to want is to be able to talk to someone about their illnesses of all types, to be able to understand where they can bring their own inner powers of healing to bear with a medical team. So I think that now, though it looks very frightening in America for this kind of a change, um, I think that what's happening actually with managed care is such a disaster that I don't expect it to last long. I think it's a flash in the pan that will take about 10 or 15 years, which is really short if you look at <laughs> yeah, a lot yeah, of time. Except in our own lifetime. Yes. Uh, and, so and in, this, yeah, in this time, during this time, I suspect that most patients are going to have to be their own advocates, though I hope that will change, and I really do expect it to. You know, it's interesting because one of the things I'm absolutely convinced about, and I'd like your experience on this, is that People sue hospitals not because they got bad care, because they're fairly sophisticated. They, they know that sometimes doctors are human, nurses are human, something will go wrong. I think they sue when they feel that they weren't honored. Yes. And therefore, I mean, again, I mean, that's probably the biggest cost for a hospital. I mean, the insurance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And why, why can't the money people, why can't the people who play with the money see that they're cutting their own throats? I mean, that's what sort of amazes me. Another one that amazes me is that in the United States, a group called the Com Committee for Economic Development, I think 30 years ago, said we would be better off as a culture, just in financial terms, let alone any other terms, if we gave everybody prenatal care. Exactly. Uh, that the costs of preemies are so outrageous, and of course getting more outrageous as we're able to keep them alive even younger, that saying that every parent, as in Britain, I mean one of the great things about Britain is every parent will get a visit, period, including, uh, they always were pleased about this, the princesses, I mean they get a visit, that's it. Mm -hmm. Why, why can't we see the obvious? What is it in the, in the current managed care system that has made us so blind and just said, well, if we cut costs, we cut things to the bone, everything's going to be cheap and work well? Well, I, I think that, that at this time, as we talk about the spirituality increasing in, medic in medical care, demand for medical care, at the same time as we say managed care, is a, it's like a, a big monster that doesn't have any vision. So if I can save a penny today, that's all I care about. They're not thinking about the future. They're not thinking about the future. I think that they expect that this is going to be a short run of lots of money for them. And I think that 
because they don't have vision, um, they will fail. But you know, it's interesting because the latest financial results haven't been tremendously favorable for managed care. Uh, a number of them are getting into very deep trouble already. You know, another, uh, I want to ask you, do you feel that children are being brought up differently? In other words, is this next generation learning this from the beginning or, or not? Are, are children getting a more spiritual view of their bodies, do you think, in general? or? In other words, have the schools begun to help or hinder on, on this process of how you see your own bodies? Well, I, I know that uh, the schools are doing a lot more teaching than reading, writing, and arithmetic these days. Right. For example, my children have learned in school an, a very simple process of mediation. It was required of all the students and the faculty. And though we're not talking about how they see their body and spirituality, they're, t they're learning how to express their own needs in ways that don't hurt other people. So that's a part of the same process to me. It's part of growing up to be whole. And so um, I think that that's an important addition to the school system. Where do you see the parallels between the personal healing and the social healing and the environmental healing? I mean, uh, is it the same thing? I'm inclined to think it is that in each of these cases, we've tended to look at the fixed model. What do we do to fix it? And what I see us slowly, painfully, and with difficulty beginning to recognize that you don't fix it, you heal it. Yes. That, uh, and the Great Lakes is a great example in the States where we simply stop throwing as much mess into the Great Lakes, and we were amazed by how quickly they came back. Um, the Hudson River is another classic example. But nature, if you don't push it beyond a certain point, and that's always a worry, does have the ability to heal, to come back, to work. I think it is the same. I think that there's a kind of a resiliency that is fueled when we move into the heart, and we move into into bringing our spirituality to healing of the nation, of the earth, of ourselves. When we move into the area of the heart and, and look at the world from our heart as if our very eyes were in our heart, it is one. The path is one. I have a great teacher, Rachel Naomi Remen, who says that, that there is one well. There are many buckets, but there's one well. And so healing in any form, if it comes from the heart, is, is part of the same well. Well, one of the healings, it seems to me, we desperately need, and I know this is a place where you've done an enormous amount of work, is around death itself. Uh, I don't know enough about Australian culture to really sense how they come out on this, but I think all Anglos tend to be really afraid of death. And I think that until we can come to see death as part of the life cycle rather than something which, I mean, which has to be fought forever. I mean, I can understand why people say I don't want to die now, but, you know, there is almost this sense of death should never happen. And it seems to me some of this drive for immortality is I don't want to consider death as an option. And yet, uh, as a priest said to me once, you know, there is only, at least for the moment only one certainty, and that is death will happen now question of when rather than that. I think a lot of your work has been around making death appropriate, acceptable, and being a place where you can, where you can heal into, into death. And what, what have you been learning about that? What, what have you discovered about that? I think for me the greatest the greatest teaching in my life has been the honor of being with people as they were dying over the last 25 years. And for those people who I've worked with that are willing to try and experiment with me, for example, and go inside themselves and soften around pain and fear, learn to do that through, for example, process of, processes of guided imagery that I do with them, which has them relax, and then go in their mind to a very beautiful place and talk to an image of their own fear or talk to an image of their own uh, spirituality or talk to an image of their own pain. 
what we find is that the pain is a teacher, invariably a teacher. The fear is a teacher. And um, what people learn to do sometimes is to soften around the pain and to live from moment to moment instead of focusing on the moment when they won't be able to take another breath. That's the fear model of dying that we were taught, basically. Um, when we're taught that we don't really have the skills inside to heal, when we were taught then to go outside for healing, we think about that last breath with terror. But when we go inside to heal and we learn to soften around pain and fear, we're able to access a place of peace in ourselves that is impossible with the loud cries of fear. When fear speaks in us, it's such a loud voice that the voice of tenderness, the voice of love, the voice of peace, they don't get heard. They get heard in more stillness. So when people can go inside like that, what they experience and what their families witness is the incredible spiritual power at the moment of death. For example, I remember a woman dying of colon cancer. She had many relatives who died of colon cancer, but the physician assured her, we'll catch yours in time. We'll do hemocults on you every three months, and they missed it, and she died of colon cancer. She died the last week of her life, or the last three days of her life, hanging onto her sheets, saying, no, 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 constantly, around the clock. People thought she must be in pain. They gave her huge amounts of morphine, didn't touch this process. I sat with her on the bed as she said, no, 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 over and over in a gravelly kind of fury. And I told her it was fine for her to be angry, letting her have her anger. And one minute in all of these hours that went by, her face suddenly changed. She looked up in the corner. Her face became the face of bliss. She said, oh, and died. Her family saw the transformation in that tenth of a second shift in her face. And they knew she'd been healed. Now, when people die in the fear model, and they have their, their arms out saying, give me some shot, doc, I can't stand the pain. We know now that much of pain is alarm. And so people can get huge amounts of morphine, for example, that doesn't touch the alarm. And those people end up getting more and more morphine, and in some countries like England, heroin itself, and uh, die snowed, we call it, when they're unconscious. And so the family doesn't see the healing process. They don't see the experience of transformation that happens with a death. You know, you talked to me about this extraordinary experiences you've had with people in comas who have clearly, in a sense, don't want to be there because, I mean, you know, you really don't want to be in a coma for the rest of your life, which we call life. Mm -hmm. And you talked to me about how you have been able to release people in comas. Yes, it's, Can you explain it, that? Yes, it's been a wonderful experience in my life. I used to get called by a hospital in Seattle to come in when patients would be hanging on in a coma and not seem to be able to let go. And I recognize that there's a very good reason they're not letting go. This work is done with intense respect for the people that are ill, that are lying in a coma. So I would go in and introduce myself to the patient, knowing that they can hear me, knowing that they're present with me, and then in, involve the family uh, in a unique way, I think. I would take each person in the family aside and get to know them a little bit and ask them, if your mother were hanging on because of worry for you, what would it be about? and then ask them what their plan is to do to take care of that problem. So then after I did that with everybody in the family, I would bring the family together around the patient and explain to the patient, if it's Mary that you're worried about, um, Mary has something to say to you about that. And Mary would say, Mom, if you're hanging on because you know that I've been kind of in, a, in having problem with drugs, I want you to know that I'll commit to you that I'll get into a drug treatment program and I've already signed up or I will sign up today after we leave here. So, and then each person would go around the table. I would tell the person in the coma the qualities I see in each of the family members that will help them achieve their goals they've just stated. At this time, then, we say a prayer. Everybody in the room gives the person permission to go, to die. 
and let go. And uh, invariably, the person died at that time. What does that say about the nursing homes that I visit with such agony and where there are huge numbers of people who clearly really don't want to be there. I remember a friend of ours called Sophie Burden who spent about two years just with no, not able to do anything with her life. In, in a culture that is terrified of death. Yes. This culture does not teach people how to die. So something I call practicing dying is a skill that I don't know anybody that has it. So many times I've talked with, I've talked with people very late in their lives, though that they, they don't have an illness that will take them, but they're done. They feel as though they want to go and they're ready to go. And there's a wonderful way to help them talk about if somebody were going to meet you on the other side, who would it be? And through guided imagery, again, helping them relax and allow an image of that person to meet them in their mind, they can get into dialogue with that person. And invariably, when I've done this, that person says, I'm here to help you over. And at that point, they answer questions and talk a little bit. And then my job is to help them practice how to let go, which may include um, imagining that as they exhale, their, their consciousness or their soul or what they would call it is lifting gently out of their head and they're taking the hands of the person that's meeting them. And when we practice that skill after the dialogue with the person, I've had the experience too of people learning to let go when they feel ready to let go. And then they're, they're less victimized by a culture who doesn't teach them how to die. Do people who have learned how to live die better? In other words, if, if we knew how to live, if we knew how to enjoy life, if we knew how to live in the moment, would we find dying easier, do you think? I mean, so, you know, one of the enormous changes that we've been trying to talk about through these programs is the need to live in the present. Uh, we've always had a destination rhetoric, and I think, I think we've quoted this before. People prepare to work, prepare to return, prepare to die. You're always preparing. It's always yes. the next step. There's always something yes. else, not now. People are rarely present in their lives. Um, we were at a service together just recently where somebody said, look, what you've got is now. Uh, and the Hopi uh, language only allows you to talk about now. You, you haven't got a past. You haven't got a future. You've got to talk in the present. And you think what that would do to the way we perceived life. So if people, in a sense, know how to live in the present, does that help them when they reach the end of life? That's certainly been my experience. Because people who know how to live in the now, who, as Larry said in the service we, you spoke of, it's about the destination. It's, not a, it's about the, the journey, not the destination. Um, people that know how to live in the moment, also live through their dying. I've often said over the years, there's really no such thing as dying. We're alive or we're dead. Um, the process at the end of life is a unique process. But really, there's no such thing as dying. We're still here. Um, I remember being called in as a hospice therapist to see a family right away because the death was imminent and I had to get out to the house. This was in Seattle many years ago. And I went out to the house and the man of the house met me at the door in his 70s. He had a glow about him that disarmed me. And I walked in the house with him, and he said, I'll get my wife. She, she may need to talk with you. He came from the bedroom carrying in his arms a bag of bones. She must have weighed 55 pounds. And he put her on the couch with such love, and I heard her laugh. She looked up at me, she looked at him, she radiated love. She was not afraid to die. I asked them if they could tell me a little bit about their life together. And what came from both of them was a life of living in the moment. Death to her was a step through a doorway. She wasn't afraid, she'd been through other transitions. I think that people that really learn to live have learned to die many times in their lives because you can't let a new belief system in without letting go of one to make room for the new. 
and value the death. We lose part of our identity. And when people hang on tight to what they believe, it's hard to let go. You know, that's an interesting cut because when we came over from Europe many, many years ago, the thing that struck us most about Americans was their inability to take an idea out of their head and sort of say, I'm going to look at this idea. Is it a good idea or a bad idea? Bad idea? I don't need it. It ain't me. It, it's, it's not my personality. It's not who I am. It's the way I've structured the universe. And it, it struck us as extraordinarily different to the average European who really is much more willing to say, oh, yeah, I've got ideas, and they're interesting, but I'm willing to think about that. Yes. And it seems to me if you tie, I mean, if it's really, I'm just extending your comment, but if that really is the necessity, if the necessity, in a sense, is to make, to accept small deaths, to say, okay, yeah, th that died, yeah, that, that's fine. That, that's part of life, that's part of living. I talk about mind quakes. I, I, I think people find in this culture, this American culture at least, mind quakes very difficult. The idea that, oh, that they're fun, you know. Hey, that's a new idea. That gives me a whole new take on the world. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's a desire for stability. There's a de desire to keep it the way it's always been. In a, in a culture that fears death, it is a culture that fears change. Death mm. is a great change. And so in a culture that fears change, people are not going to allow change to change who they are. And if people can allow change to transform them, they will live in the moment. And they will change and they will see death as just another step. But what's that say in a culture where we are being, and I mean it's not only America, I think we've got to be real careful, no culture really wants change. And if you look at this, and again in the context of these programs, what we've been saying is that in the old days, or in the old cultural change processes, you've always had a new culture that's come along and said, okay, we're stronger than you are, we're better than you are, we'll kill you off. I mean, and it may have been violence, or it may, be, yeah, or it may have been economic, etc., etc. So Britain did fairly well for a while, and then Germany did well, and then America did well, etc., etc. And you go back, and Egypt did well, Greece did well, Rome, uh, Rome did well. Now we have to change for survival. I mean, if we're going to change, it's going to have to be internal change. And it seems to me that somewhere there's a real connection here between it. all we've been saying. And if health is the ability to cope with change, uh, what, how do we, how do we cross cut the things you're saying with, with this extraordinary need for our cultures to say, hey, change is fun. I mean, I, I, I you know, I really get quite amazed and dismayed by what happens to people when suddenly something comes along which, which threatens the stability of their world. And, you know, they, they, they seem to fall apart to many people when you say, but that isn't the way it is. And I say, okay, that isn't the way it is. And either, well, yeah, that's something I've got to work on. But very often that's very exciting. I mean, let's move with it. Let's go with it. And I suppose surfing is one of the images I'm using that we live in an immense wave of change, and can we ride the surf without getting wiped out? Well, I think that that's one of the exciting things about being alive now. I think that disaster, of whatever type it is, invites us to move into the heart. That's the beauty of disaster. It breaks the rules. And I think that we're living in a time where there's more disaster and there's more opportunity to live from the heart. The more disaster you have, the more opportunity there is to accept change. And the disasters we talk about that are looming on the horizon, environmentally, for example, are uh, one of the ways that people are going to change. So I think that as the, I think it's already happening. I think the change of moving into the heart and bringing soul to our own lives and spirituality to our healing is already happening. And I think that uh, perhaps disasters that come will be the final push where people will not be able to survive unless they change. You see, I think we deeply share the belief that things are happening. A friend, a friend of mine has this great line, things are getting better and better and worse and worse, faster and faster. Why is it that we don't, as a culture, see how much has already happened? It's back, in a sense, to the health question, but I'm now broadening it out and say, I find wherever I go, 
it's not difficult to talk to people. It's, it's not only people who come to listen to me, obviously. I mean, that, that's a biased sample. But I get them to talk to a group which has really no experience about this stuff, wouldn't... Uh, uh, I did a speech called The Healing Century, and a teacher in Hawaii decided to give it to her class. And, you know, I didn't have any idea what they would do. And the general reaction was, well, isn't it wonderful somebody's talking about the issues which matter? And we haven't really been told we can do anything about this. Uh, it's not that we don't know that we ought to be doing something, but, you know, we have to live outside a place where we have power, where we have influence, because everybody said, well, you're just students. Uh, you've got to learn for the moment. And here's somebody saying, I went up to Pearson College, which is a world's college from all over the world, and the group's got real, you know, they have speakers coming on all, all, all the time. They got real good because the speaker comes in and says, here's the answer. And they're really good. And they say, well, there's not a very good answer. And they say, well, it is it. And I said, this is the question. They were totally disarmed. They had no clue what to do with me because they said, you're going to have to solve this, not me. I'm not the expert. I'm not, I'm not coming in to give you answers. So why, just as in health, we haven't really recognized the system is changing, so that managed healthcare continues to run because we don't realize that's what so many people don't want anymore. Why, in a sense, is the culture unable to recognize this? And we've been talking about this, you know, in a sense, we've been talking about why doesn't radio programming and the thing we're now doing reflect how much energy there is. So the programs like this tend to be exceptional rather than the norm. Uh, this is not what we normally get. We're still talking policy and directions. And whether Clinton really did what he said to have done or not, which frankly is not a very interesting set of speculations. There are other things that could have a lot more depth to them. Well, Robert, I think that the type of changes we're talking about, they need to start in the small, vulnerable places where we we are so frightened of what's happening, maybe to our body, for example, with illness or disaster. They happen in our vulnerability. That's where the seed is grows. That's where we allow the little seed to break open, which is a painful thing, and a new shoot to come out. It's very different, for example, from the process of Eisenhower building the highway system in the United States. <laughs> that, you get out there, you dig in the ground, you build a highway, and you, you end up in many ways hurting the environment disastrously with cars. They, they, they did that because of money. But that's a decision somebody can make. This is a process that begins in the small heart, battling with its own fear and taking a courageous step to try something new. Maybe reach to God or spirit or our deepest image of wisdom, our own wisdom. It has to begin on a one-by-one -one basis, which is why I think it's begun. But people don't know how to talk about it very well. So it's not being talked about. But when you talk about it with them, they recognize what you're saying. And I think that it will develop its own momentum. And at a certain point, it's going to be like the 100th monkey. Everybody's going to be talking about it. It wouldn't surprise me. And I've seen it shifting over 25 years. Not fast enough for me, of course, but <laughs> then things usually aren't. Uh, you see, it's interesting because... I think one of you, you've raised one of the keys. Uh, people sometimes accuse me of saying, Robert, all you want is dialogue. All you want is places for people to have this conversation. And they say, well, that's not a very dramatic model, is it? And I say, no, it isn't a very dramatic model. But I think people need the space to find out who they are so they can move out and do things. But let me share one of my profound worries with you, and that is that if the inertia of the culture continues, if we don't break the managed care system, does there come a time when things are so bad that our birth, which is clearly taking place, doesn't happen? And if you use the birth analogy and you throw too much junk at the fetus, the fetus either doesn't get born or it gets born damaged, etc., etc. And there's a whole issue here for me, the, the degree to which we are responsible for now saying, no, we cannot tolerate anymore what's going on in the culture. Yes. And I don't know. And I mean, this is a, this is a deep area of not knowing for me because, you know, in the old days I'd have got out and said, we've got to organize, we've got to get it done. And, you know, I was real good at that. And I know that isn't the route. Yes. Well, sick people are not out in the streets with, with getting attention from crowds. 
their home dealing with the, the pain in their heart. Um, I think that what's required of us, and those of us who are trying to change the world in, sense, in that way, what's required of us, ironically, is that we hold a place of faith. I think that worry is the opposite of prayer. I think that, that uh, worry sends a negative message and it sends negative energy and it builds its own negative power. The idea, when I worry, what I try and do right away when I find myself worrying is to sit down and visualize things going well and send a sense, a vision of hope. So we have to hold this thing called faith. What is that? Trust. What is that? And by holding faith and trust, we continue to grow so that we aren't going to burn out. Well, let me take it one step further. One of the things I found is that in a group these days, where the group goes really depends on if somebody has the courage to say, I don't want to go where we've always gone. I don't want to play the same agenda. I'm sick and tired of this stuff. I know there's a better way. And then to let it go, not to say, I know where this meeting goes, or I know what the answer is, or I know what I want to achieve, but I don't want to sit here and gripe and groan and be miserable and talk about how bad things are. I want to talk about where we could be going. I want to talk about the positives. I want to talk about the assets. And when you do that, you suddenly find out how much is going on. I just had a meeting in Spokane where people were saying, hey, there's all this exciting stuff going on in the neighborhoods and the families and everything else, but we don't know about it. And somebody came up with this fascinating image of there's a Christmas tree and it's got all its lights on, but we haven't yet lit them up. And what does it take to put the power through the system so we can say, oh, look at all of these incredible things that are going on in Spokane. And it's not only Spokane, it's everywhere. I think it's a paradox because we get born alone and we die alone. There's a wise woman who said to me once, there's two great truths in the world and three great lessons. The truths are we are utterly alone in the world. The second truth is we are never alone in the world. The lessons are hanging on, letting go, and I forgot the other one. <laughs> it's in there somewhere. It's in there somewhere. But I think that... <clears throat> it's that obviously not the most important of the three. <laughs> Maybe very much the most important. But I think that, that the change we're talking about is something we do alone. But at a certain point, we start seeking out others that believe the same thing. And I think that we're heading in that direction. And the momentum of the change will, uh, will grow I believe that will succeed. Well, coming to the end of the program, what haven't you had a chance to talk about that you think really people need to hear? What, what, what's, what's important to you as you look back on the conversation and say, well, I want to close this off this way. What's the matter message of what we've been trying to say? Oh, well, for, me, for me, the message is, if there's a way that you can love someone as they're dying. Go witness a death surrounded by love instead of fear. If you can do that, it will change the way you see the world. And you'll recognize that death is just one more step through a different doorway. As are all these changes we're trying to make. It's one step. You really feel that, and, and you're really saying, it, by saying that, that one of the core barriers to us shifting is this fear of physical death, that until we confront that, until we realize that that is not what we think it is. It's because it's the greatest fear. People need to look at that. Um, I know that people have said to me for 25 years in my work, well, if I can get through this, I can do anything. And if people can witness a death without fear, they'll know that they can change in other ways. It's like going to the, to the biggest change of all. Seeing that change is not as frightening. The little changes along the path seem like peanuts. So I think it's an important place to begin and an important place to end. As you think about death, you always talk about there being people on the other side to help. You want to talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that one of the jobs that I consider mine when I've been working in the hospitals over the years is uh, when people start talking in the days before death with someone that isn't in the room. 
which is a very common experience. My job is to guard the door and keep everybody out until that conversation is done. And then to initiate a discussion about it. Who are you seeing? People that are dying, get, the families tell us, the nurses tell us, well, they're a, little, they're a little demented because of the drugs. And I'd never go for that. Um, there's a language that dying people speak that once you hear it a number of times, you can pick up on. And it's the language of the bridge. It's the language of the bridge. It's always there. Um, I, I uh, have been very honored to be able to be, or gifted, I should say, to be able to underhear these conversations and understand what they mean in my life. Um, this isn't to mention the, the, the guided imagery dialogue we do with people that are, that are meeting other people. But I believe it, it's as real as the chair I'm sitting in is. And I don't think that the universe is as small as some might think it is. I think the majesty and the magic of the universe includes connection to the next level of life. Well, you know, it really is amazing how people will deny even the most obvious of this, like the near-death experiences where people come back with a basically common statement about what happens in yes. a near-death experience. You have people say, that can't be real. Yes. So let, let me close this by, as always, asking you a question about which hopefully you will struggle with until the next program. A struggle may be the wrong word, or maybe it's the right word, because in some ways it is a struggle if we're going to look at this. What would you do differently if the master metaphor of your life was healing? Can you see a first step that you would take? And do you see your own personal greatest need at the personal, or the family, or the neighborhood, or the community, or the environmental level? You need to remember in answering these questions that healing can involve pain as well as joy. Joy doesn't happen without pain. Re-examination may make it necessary to face realities one is preferred to ignore. Thank you for listening. <laughs>